The thing with ayahuasca specifically is you never know what to expect. They say the mother doesn't give you what you want, it gives you what you need. The red line is that you are the medicine and that everything is available to you at all times. There is nothing that is not perfect. There is this God essence that is within you all the time. And the medicines, they help remind us that because we get so caught up in the society that is based on consumerism and marketing. And instead, it shows us something that's very primal. And that is that we are not alone here, that we are working with different forces of nature and that we're working with the divine intelligence that is moving through us and through us experiencing itself. Welcome to the James Zander Trip, where we dive into spirituality, consciousness, mindset, plant medicine, and reaching your highest calling, your soul's destiny. My first guest is a very special soul. He is the co-founder of Vortex Retreats, and he has spent the last few years traveling around South America, learning from the indigenous communities and working with plants, breath work, movement, and meditation. He joins me today to dive into his ayahuasca experiences, his mushroom trips, the lessons he's learned from the plants, his relationship with God, how he overcame depression, his self-hypnosis experiments, and his wild hitchhiking stories. Please welcome my good friend, Jacob Grichar. Jacob, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you here. <laughs> so I wanted to start with the mind-body connection, because you have a really fascinating story about that from your childhood and teenage years. Do you want to get into that? Yeah, sure. Uh, mind-body connection for me means the relationship that we have with how we feel, how we embody our emotions, how we embody the way we think as well. So from my personal story, I when I was growing up, I had a severe eczema which is a very um, strong skin disease throughout my whole body. I had these rashes that were sometimes so painfully itchy that throughout the whole night, I was not able to sleep. I developed severe insomnia and sometimes I would wake up bleeding because I would be scratching myself. Just unconsciously scratching Just yourself. unconsciously, whenever I would fall asleep, if I fell asleep, I would wake up being scratched, being bloody. That happened when I was very young and then it went away happened again in the second wave in my early teens and then got me into the whole exploration of different medicinal plants i read a book in my grandma's cupboard which was talking about different different medicinal plants that we can use for different things and at the end of that book there was a chapter on hypnosis and it was the first time i've ever heard that term hypnosis outside of you know the cartoon movie scene and I read the chapter on it and I was like, oh, maybe that could help. So I started researching, I read books about self-hypnosis and I started making my own audio recordings. And I would literally hypnotize myself to sleep every single night. And that went on for a couple of, um, a couple of months. I developed really good sleeping habit and I kept on reading books about meditation, about hypnosis around 13, 12 to 13 years old. I started developing my own meditation practice. And within this, my skin started getting better. And I realized the more I would invoke different emotions that were positive in my body and consciously create them in my mind, developing these healthier patterns of thinking and of seeing myself and seeing the world around me, my physical body actually started responding in a positive way. In about three months, my skin disease went away completely. And that's when I started really thinking about how much power our minds have to influence our physical reality. And then it goes beyond the body. It goes to our physical reality all around us. And we actually have this power within us to physically change everything that is around us. And that was the first time I've actually had that interaction and I've never quite understood it up to that point. And after that, this is what took me on that whole exploration of the mind body, of the psychedelic experience, of everything that we are able to do with our minds. So it was like your first experience in manifestation as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, when it you, definitely was. When you were like, do these self-hypnosis tapes, how, what were you saying to yourself or what were you recording? Well, at first I followed scripts that I found online. Um, they were more about just putting me to sleep because that's something I struggled with. I struggled with insomnia, so I would put myself to sleep. So in the beginning, it wasn't even about healing the it was, eczema. It was just no, about getting some it was sleep. just, that was the most important thing. You know, they say, if you don't sleep in three weeks, you go completely crazy and you die. They actually made this experiment on rats where they would, it's a really cruel experiment actually, but they would wake them up every time the rat would fall asleep. And they did that for three weeks. In three weeks, the rat died. And they wanted to conduct the same thing on humans, obviously very unethical, so they never did it. Um, as far as we know. As far as we know, <laughs> yeah. Um, but they say that within a week without sleeping, you go crazy. And I can see that within me. I can see that with a lot of other people that I know struggle with like light insomnia. Um, within just a few days of not sleeping, you become groggy, your brain doesn't function, you get brain fog, uh, you can't concentrate. Those are just mild symptoms. And it can get more and more severe if it progresses. So you're doing these hypnosis tapes to fall asleep. At what point do you realize you can also do this to heal the condition? Well, the way my mind works and has always worked was when I'm interested into something, I don't go halfway. I just fully dive into the topic. So at that point, my whole life became self-hypnosis. And I realized that meditation is actually the same as self-hypnosis to a certain degree. Maybe with meditation, you're not at first able to go as far because it's not something external guiding you. But in its essence, it's kind of the same. Um, so most monks and experienced meditators that are able to go very deep in their practice actually are in a way hypnotizing themselves. And at some point, maybe in about a month, I stopped using tapes and I switched to my own meditation practice where I would sit down in every morning for probably half an hour to an hour and I would go through a process of rediscovering myself, of embodying things that are more beneficial to my future, pretty much. Like visualizing, feeling positive emotion, describe that experience. All of that. So I would track where the emotion is going within my body and I would attach a color and a sound to it. And then I would observe how it's moving with complete detachment. So all that self-hate, all that doubt, all that worry, everything that was coming up for me because the skin disease is not the only thing that happens. When you are going through something so severe in your development, developmental age, um, especially when other kids are having first you know, experiences with other sex and um, going out, having friends. And I was experiencing a lot of loneliness. I was experiencing a lot of self-doubt and self-hate at that point. So I would observe where these emotions were in my body, where they were stuck, and I would follow them as much as I could. And then at some point, I created what I think is alchemy and just transmuted them into something that was beneficial. I decided to feel in a certain way, and I would create that feeling within my body. And then I would amplify it to the point where it was so strong, it was almost unbearable. And I would feel these immense amounts of joy and gratitude. It would make me cry, it would make me sob. Sometimes it was so painful, I had to stop. But it was these positive emotions that were both bursting throughout my body. And I got surges of really positive energy. I got motivation to move again, to move my body, to do things, to go out, to explore. And at some point, just this pure ecstasy of life kind of transmuted, I think, whatever was physically wrong as well. And I think eventually this was what my healed my body. And this was the entry point towards other types of spirituality and other types of self-healing. Because if I had not discovered how much power we have in our minds, I would not change other parts of my life as well. If someone is suffering from loneliness or depression, and they wanted to use a similar technique of tapping into those emotions, what, what would you recommend to them? I would recommend to start wherever you can. So there's a lot of tools that are available and it can be very overwhelming. When you search for 
something that you're going through and you search for the solution, there's a lot of marketing that happens. And everyone is offering you uh, pretty much this pill that is going to solve all of your problems. So whereas this is EFT, the emotional freedom technique or trauma release or whatever it is, it's not a one-time solution. It's something you need to work through. It's a practice. It's a practice. And the most important thing at the core of this practice is to understand that there is nothing wrong with feeling lonely and there is nothing wrong with feeling sad. There accepting is accepting the emotion. Yeah, it's accepting the emotion, accepting the polarity. Mm. Um, because I think we had this conversation not so long ago, actually. I feel that the way the universe is experiencing itself is experiencing itself in polarity, in duality. So one part is sadness, is is loneliness, the other part is everything positive, everything that we want to feel. But you cannot understand what the positive emotions are if you don't have anything to compare them to. So it's just accepting that everything is going in cycles and everything is going in waves and we're just experiencing every aspect of it. I feel like this understanding is much more important than trying to transmute it all the time and trying to feel great all the time. But it sounds like that's what you did when you were younger. The initial aspect was to transmute it. Yeah. But now you're more about accepting the whole spectrum. Yes, because sometimes the things become so overwhelmingly negative that we start going in a downward spiral. And when you're going in a downward spiral, it's really hard to pull yourself out from it. And it's the same way as if you're only accepting love and light and pretending that everything is perfect all the time. It's not a healthy way to be. The same way going downwards all the time, being depressed all the time, I realized it's not my optimal state. It's not what I want to live in. But accepting the duality of both is where I think the balance comes from. Would you say that we're still trying to sort of have most of our frequency in those positive emotions? Yeah, that, that is the neuroplasticity. So the brain adjusts to whatever you are doing the most. The way you learn habits, the way you learn to, for example, if you're constantly working on the computer, if you're writing codes for the programs, your brain is going to adapt to that and you're going to become better at it. If you're more into sports and you're doing more movement stuff, your brain starts adapting to doing more movement stuff. And maybe if you're not doing the programming, that becomes much harder for you. The same way when you're feeling positive things, the more you're feeling positive things, the more your brain is adjusting to learning how to feel more of that. And that becomes your baseline, your base state. So as you're doing those meditations, your baseline was slowly increasing because you were kept tapping into joy. It's like a vortex of joy. It's rewiring your, your neural network. And that is then what heals the body. Yeah, the body follows. So you healed the eczema, you healed the skin condition. And then talk to me about in your teenage years, were you still experiencing some depression or some loneliness? I actually haven't after that. My life completely switched around. I went to, to I kept meditating um, pretty much every day. I had consistent practice for years. And um, I got more into sports. I got more into travel. And I think this whole neural repatterning that I have done has showed me that the life that I was living was not aligned with where I wanted to be. And that is why eventually at 17, 18 years old, I've decided to leave Slovenia. Your home country. My home country, where I'm from, yeah. And, um, and eventually find other things. I was in a way looking for a teacher. I was in a way looking for somebody who could in person guide me through developing more. Where did that call come from? Like you're in Slovenia um, and you feel unhappiness. You feel like a mismatch between your environment and who you are. Yeah. What are you, where is the call coming from for something like a teacher or a mentor? I think it's a soul, soul lesson, soul, soul calling. It was something that came from much deeper than just me reading books. Because since I was a kid, I've been fascinated with with fiction books, with mystical experiences. When I first read um, Hatha Yoga Pradipika talks about Kundalini awakening that was in my early teens, 
I wanted to do that. I wanted to see what that is like. It planted a seed. And it planted it. a seed. And all of these things planted the seed. And I think at some level, I never believed that what we are taught in school is everything there is. But the structure in the environment that I was living was very limited. So Slovenia is one of those countries where you're meant to follow a path. And that path is you go to school, you go to university, you get a job. Somewhere in between, you find a partner. Maybe you get married and then you get a house, you get kids and they do the same. And, and I think a lot of forever. <laughs> and I feel a lot of countries are like that. It's not something that resonated with me. I didn't see myself studying for another five years to find a job where I'm going to be sitting in the office. Was there a vision in your mind of what did resonate with you? Not exactly. It was just this unconditioned curiosity, this idea that I wanted to explore so many different things. It was the idea that I wanted to see the world, that I wanted to move around, that I wanted to feel other places and meet other people and experience different spiritual practices as well, different beliefs from different countries. And so you're 17 or 18, you decide to leave home. Mm -hmm. How did your parents react? <laughs> Um, at first, no one believed that. They didn't think you'd do it. No. Um, when I was around 16, I think I came up with that idea. And I remember in school, there was a... I started dropping out of high school. I would do my own studies at home. And I felt that all the schooling was a bit of a wasted time for me. So whatever I needed to learn, I would learn really fast at home just before the exams. And I aced most of them. Um, but most of the other time, I would either spend moving my body or learning about nutrition or meditating or reading books, listening to Tony Robbins seminars or different teachers that resonated with me at the time. And um, Following your own guidance. Following my own guidance. It, in a way, re-educating myself. And I knew that what I was learning at school did have maybe a little bit of value, but not a practical value that I needed in life because I wasn't going to go to university. I wasn't get, going to get a specific job. Um, so with that, I started telling people that instead of university, I'm going to go travel the world. And the way they reacted was... Which is, the, by the way, the best thing that a young person <laughs> can do, right? Yes, like, I absolutely. always recommend to people, go take a gap year. Go yeah. backpack. Go live in hostels. Go wash dishes in some mm -hmm. restaurant, like in another country. Yeah, and I wouldn't say only for a young person, I would say for anyone. For anyone, yeah. Just being outside of this structure that you grew up in, it's so valuable. It's stepping outside of the box and seeing it from the other perspective and being like, oh, this is where I grew, grew up in. And if it doesn't resonate with me, I don't have to stay there. And it's, I think, to see that there's so much more outside the box. Yeah, We think we know that, but it's when we really start traveling and we experience other cultures. Nothing really beats that yeah. first-hand experience. Yeah. So you're, you're 16, you tell them you're leaving. They don't believe you. <laughs> and then... They believed me. They just thought I was going to come back in about a month. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen, did it? That didn't happen. <laughs> no, it's been around eight years now. Wow. So when you first left, how old were you? I was, I think I just turned 19. 19. I was 18 to 19 when I left Slovenia. And what was the first country that you went to? I went for a trip to, well, I've traveled before a little bit. I think the first really bigger trip that I've taken was um, to Romania when I was around 16 years old. And then when I was 19, the first country I went to was Israel. Um, came back to Slovenia for a short amount of time and then moved to Barcelona. And that move, move to Barcelona was when I eventually completely decided to break out. Of the matrix. Of the matrix. That was In the way. inception <laughs> point. That was the beginning of like the eight years of travel. Yeah, that was the move that made it all happen. So you moved to Barcelona, but things don't go super smooth in Barcelona, do they? No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that. Um, at the time, I was working with a network marketing company, and I was feeling that I, I kind of accepted other people's goals for that. 
I was never a person that would be wanting to grab more money and have beautiful houses and cars, but everyone in the company did. So I kind of adapted to their beliefs a little bit and their visions. Isn't that funny how we take on other people's goals, even subconsciously yeah. without noticing? Yeah, and it can it happens all the time. It happens when we look at what our parents want and what they want is actually not what they want. It's what society tells them they want. Or what their grand, or what their mother wanted, what their yeah. father wanted. Yeah, and we see other people and we see, mainly it comes from marketing. It comes from TV. It comes from advertising. People show us that, oh, I have more material things. It makes me happier. Or the person that's the richest has the best life. Whereas, in fact, they're usually the most unhappy ones. Um so I adapted their beliefs and I moved with the company to Barcelona. I decided that I'm going to open an office for them there. And once I was there, it hit me that maybe that was not exactly what I wanted. And I stayed there with a couple of my friends and we started slacking a little bit on our work. We didn't know what we were doing. We decided to seek different hobbies as well and go out more than we were working. And eventually the whole project imploded when one of my friends decided to leave with a big chunk of our savings. He stole your money, other people's money. Well, he, yeah, he decided to, to live with most of what we've put together. So what happened? <laughs> like you wake up or you, you find out that he's No, gone? actually he told us that in our face. Um, he just told us his justification of what the reality is. And at the time, I was going through my own spiritual process, so I didn't want to argue with that. I felt like all material things don't have as much worth, so I just let it go. And so now you're in Barcelona, you have Close no money. Close to zero, yeah. Almost zero money. Yeah. What happens? What do you do? We moved to the cheapest country we could find, which was Hungary. We moved to Budapest with another friend of mine. Good old Budapest. <laughs> Saving the day. <laughs> yeah, and we found we found the shittiest jobs we could find. We worked in party hostels, leading people on pub crawls, um, pretty much, yeah, partying every day. Were you happier in a weird way in Budapest than you were with the money working in it, it was a huge relief for me. Yeah. I feel like I've gone through stages in my life where I've lost everything. Just before I left Slovenia, actually, that was one of these moments. And then in Barcelona was another one. It happened again, like probably a year later in France. Um, what happened where in I ended up, Well, I ended up homeless for a little bit. Um, it was, I didn't come with so much money. When I left Budapest and I traveled through Slovenia, through Italy and to France, and eventually I spent all my savings and I ended up in the streets of France with nothing. But what I knew was that that whole party scene that I was participating in in Budapest was also not my path. So in a way, I was still seeking of where I actually see myself fitting in. But it's hard when you don't have a spiritual community around you, when you're grew up in a box when you grew up in an apartment where nobody talks about meditation, psychedelics, when they don't talk about finding new ways of, of being, of feeling. And I've always felt weird when I was doing that. And you don't know there's other weird people out there that if you just find yeah. the tribe. Yeah, when you find the tribe, everything is easier. That's something we're actually aiming at doing throughout everything that we're doing now with all of the people around me. We're building up the tribe where it's more and more support, more and more communication, more and more guidance for people that are where we used to be and where we started. And so when you're homeless in France, where what happened? Did you sleep on the street? I sometimes slept on the street. Most of the time I hitchhiked. Um, I used the app called Couchsurfing where you could get... Oh, I love that app. I, I love it. It's the most brilliant backpacking app. You stay on other people's couch and in exchange, when you have your own, you host them. And that would like save me quite a lot because I got fed. I could sleep in an actual house with a roof and um, I got a shower, which is a huge plus. <laughs> plus you meet some of the most kind, amazing people. Like I've met. The most generous ones. And 
what is what was the next step in your evolution from that point on? That that whole part of my life probably went on for about a year and a half. It wasn't so long, but it was very intense. Um, so I went from Barcelona to Budapest, through France to UK to London, um, and eventually in London, what happened was I got a job. I was working. I was paid pretty well, um, but I haven't seen sunlight. You know how well London works. <laughs> Pretty for, for months at the time, yeah. And my jobs were kind of between um, working in fancy bars as bartender and working in fancy cafes as a barista. And um, the whole hospitality things also take a toll. So I ended up with severe depression again. And it's called seasonal depression. I understand that a little bit more now because when you don't see sunlight, your brain does not produce happiness molecules, your melatonin is messed up, you can't sleep so well. And that pretty much brought up everything I've been experiencing when I was a teenager for me. So I decided to leave London and with my partner at the time, we wanted to move to Australia. And just before we moved to Australia, I, I told her I will do a three month long trip through Southeast Asia. And throughout that time, I was just seeking thrill. I was seeking things that would make me feel the most alive. I would motorbike through Vietnam like crazy. I was hitchhiking through the whole th Thailand, all the way from Bangkok to Malaysia to Kuala Lumpur, which took me three weeks. But one of the most profound experiences that happened and the life-changing one was in the north of Thailand. I tried mushrooms for the first time. And it wasn't a full dose, but it was just enough of a dose to break me out of that needing to numb through thrill. It brought me into the present moment, into my body, and made me feel that everything is gonna be okay. And it basically cut the whole feeling of depression for the whole night while I was enjoying the mushrooms in the bonfire. Dude, mushrooms are so powerful. They're one of the most beautiful medicines, yeah. And they cut through the BS. You know, whatever is clouding your mind, it's like they lift the veil. And for yeah. those six, eight hours, you see the truth, the truth of light, the truth of love, yeah, the truth about yourself. Yeah. So that first experience was, even though it wasn't a full dose, it was very powerful for you. It was life changing, literally. The next day, how, what changed for you after that trip? It took me a while to process that, not because it was a profound psychedelic journey, but just because it changed how I was feeling so rapidly and so instantly. And just to be clear, um, until then, I have not tried anything aside from a little bit of weed in my teenage years and a little bit of alcohol. I was never a big drinker, even when I was bartending. So I've never tried anything else. So this journey literally showed me that there is a mind altering substance that can help you break through these negative cycles. Months of meditation for me before, self-hypnosis, self-exploration, sitting for two hours down per day were the same effect as not even a full dose of mushrooms. From one trip. Yeah. From one trip. It's insane. It's, it's, it's very ins powerful. It's so crazy in the best way. Yeah. That this one plant, actually many plants that we have access to, but mm -hmm. mushrooms can completely change someone's paradigm. Mm-hmm. And it is actually something that happens when it starts rewiring your brain. What happens is we have certain parts of our brain that fire when we do things repetitively. So that's, um, for example, when you're driving a car, you forget you're driving a car. You go into this trance state where your body is acting automatically. Everyone knows that. They call it just the trance state. But what people don't understand is that your emotions are also stored as a chemical process in your brain. So whatever you are feeling kind of comes up on repeat as well. So in a way, when you're feeling a lot of frustration with other people, when you're feeling unhappiness with where you are in your life, in your environment, that is something that your brain becomes, um, puts on an autopilot. It's like clothes that you wear. So it's an emotion you're wearing, it yeah. becomes comfortable. It, it doesn't just become comfortable, but it becomes so ingrained in you that it keeps repeating over and over again. What's been 
proven with doses, full doses of psilocybin is that it actually has the ability to completely stop that process. So in a way, maybe you've noticed um, with your experience in mushrooms, there's a dose where it's a complete loss of self or loss of ego. And I think what happens in the brain is that this part where everything is automated just becomes so blocked that you cannot perceive yourself as what you thought you were, as these brain patterns. No matter if they're good or if they're bad, you just have no interaction with that anymore. But something that's not very well known is that small doses of psilocybin do the same thing. Microdosing. Microdosing. This is where a lot of scientific evidence actually can produce a big difference in someone's life. So after the first trip, did you... The depression was still there afterwards? Yeah. It came back because it was one trip. Yeah. Did you start microdosing then? And, or or how, did that, how did your journey with mushrooms develop? So from then, it developed this fascination that did just not go away. So we moved to Australia, and as with many countries where mushrooms and different substances are illegal, um, I don't recommend finding that out, obviously, just a disclaimer. Um, but there are ways that you can get it. However, when you first arrive to a new country, you don't know anyone. It's kind of hard. You have to find the most hippie-looking person. <laughs> Talk yeah, you have to. <laughs> so I did that, actually. Um, and I asked them if they can supply me with a decent dose of mushrooms. And it took months before that supply came through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but within these months, my fascination was growing. That one half dose that I've done in Thailand has just been... Um, been pushing me to research more. And I ended up reading a book called A Very Good Day by Eilat Waldman, which describes how she microdosed LSD to heal her depression. And it's like a yellow cover, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good book. I would definitely recommend it. Um, there's a protocol in the book that says you do one dose every third day. And I think that comes from Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. Um, another book that's really, really useful. But basically, throughout the, these few months, while I was waiting for this, um, I started developing a fascination. And the way I mentioned my mind works is I dive deep into research. So I started reading everything that happens, everything about neuroplasticity, how the brain works, um, neural networks, everything that happens chemically in the body when we're going through different emotions. I was reading about melatonin, serotonin, dopamine, how they're produced, how we can affect them with our daily habits. That's where my fascination for biohacking came from as well. I dove deep into the practices that would support that once it actually happens. Um, so eventually my friend brought me a bag of mushrooms and I decided to microdose with the same protocol. So one day's on, two days off. And microdosing means you take a sub-perceptual dose. So tiny, tiny dose. Tiny, tiny dose. So if you say one mushroom would be a full dose, you would take tenth of that. So it's meant to be sub-perceptual when it, where it doesn't inhibit your ability to move around to do daily things, but in at the same time it does block that part of your brain that wants to feel the same things or have the same mental patterns. Do you know which part of the brain it's blocking? Um, we can research that. Okay. We can put it in, yeah. But basically it allows for the new patterns to come online. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. So I've noticed after probably around two weeks, that the thoughts that would come up for me were very different. I would look out the window and instead of my thinking mind being in everything I wanted to do in the future or being in anxiety of the past, it would just be purely in the present, looking at what is going on outside and enjoying it. And I've noticed myself observing that. And this is where this dissonance between the self and the observer happened, the, the distance between them. Was that your first experience of that? or you It wasn't. No, I've gone in that space throughout meditation quite a lot. 
but at that was... point, my meditation practice wasn't very strong. Uh -huh. And this experience started like showing me that there is actually, you know, it's, it's possible to like distance yourself and observe yourself enjoying the environment in the present moment. Um, and that happened after maybe two weeks of following the protocol. And every time after, the day after I would journal, I would make sure that I track my experience. And within probably a month and a half, my depression was gone. Completely. And not, not just gone a little bit, gone completely. I could not put myself in negative state, in negative spirals, let's say. I still had moments where I felt down, where I felt annoyed by things, frustrated by myself. But in a month and a half, that was not my state. That was not my baseline anymore. My baseline became the baseline of curiosity again. That's amazing. And I yeah. think the, the lesson also is that, you know, the consistency, taking it every third day or having trips, if it's a full dose, having trips once a month, you know, something where there's a consistent pattern is what helps the brain finally rewire bit by bit. Yeah, it's a really powerful tool for that. And so the depression was gone completely. You still have moments where sometimes things get challenging. Of course, we all do. What do you do in those moments? Like I said before, I think the most important thing is to just accept that, yeah. to accept that it's a part of the duality of life. We all go through moments where our thoughts, our emotions are not the most highly beneficial ones. And in order for us to understand what is really positive, what is optimal, we need to understand also what is not. So if we constantly live in the state of pure bliss and pure joy, we don't have anything to compare it to. We cannot actually appreciate how good we feel if we don't feel bad sometimes. That is my perception of it. And of course, maybe someone doesn't feel that way. But I know from feeling very depressed for longer periods of time, it's something that's almost impossible to break out of unless you have guidance of other people or guidance of the medicine of the plants. Yeah. Um, so when you go into these circles, you don't see yourself how far down you go. But then at some point you realize, wow, this is not where I want to be. So still having this realization, you can change your baseline. You can start feeling better and better. But don't forget what the lowest points are. Because the more low you feel, the higher you can feel as well. It gives you this this dance, this roller coaster of life. And right now, where I am right now, when I feel these states, I honor them, I appreciate them. I don't dwell in them, which is a key difference, mm -hmm. but I honor them. And you probably appreciate them too in some way. Of yeah. Like, ah, I get to feel the contrast, the yeah. juice of life. And then yeah. you know that you'll be able to bounce back from that. For sure. And just the trust in divine, in the source, comes very strongly here because you know that you are given these experiences to grow. There is no negative emotion that just comes out of nothing. There is a lesson there, just as it is in positive ones. They're not just there for you to enjoy it. It's for you to learn something from it. Um, in the same way, all the negative, quote unquote, negative experiences in life, they come as lessons. So the more we appreciate them as lessons, the less we dwell in them. Yeah. And the more we learn, and then we don't need to repeat them again in this vicious karmic cycle. It's like learn the wisdom of the lesson, not blame yourself or beat yourself up for it. Yes. Um, when was the first time you tried a full trip on mushrooms? Or was that many years later? That was quite a bit later, yeah. Um, after after my experience in, um, in Australia with, with the psilocybin microdose, I felt a really strong call to go to Peru to try ayahuasca. Now, now, where did you, you first read about it <laughs> in the books, right? I've never read about it. I started listening to podcasts and it's something that started coming up and up more. And you just felt the call, like you resonated with the plant ayahuasca. Yeah, it was a lot of synchronicities that I could not ignore. So almost every podcast that I would listen to would at some point mention ayahuasca. Almost every time 
I would talk to someone. They told me about their friend who knows a friend who went to Peru and tried ayahuasca. And it just kept on coming up and up more in my life until it was like consuming my curiosity so much that I couldn't deny it. I see them as like little clues from the universe. Yeah. Like something keeps popping up and no matter how much you ignore it or maybe you don't ignore it, but it's like you follow that, the breadcrumbs. You know, yeah. Like, I know there's something here for me. They're like little notes. And yeah. if you ignore them, they just become louder. What I've learned within my entire life is that if you keep ignoring the signs long enough, they're going to scream. <laughs> they're going to scream. The same way as when you ignore what your body is telling you. If you're not in tune with your body, if you're starting to feel headaches and you don't start wondering why that is, you don't change anything in your life, eventually these whispers in your body become screams. And the same way the universe is talking to us. If you are quiet enough, if you are perceptive enough, you start seeing the little synchronicities that are showing you what your next steps are. The if listening you, is part of that process. The listening, the observing, the quieting down your monkey mind as well. And because ego wants to control, ego doesn't want to change things. So in this way, this is kind of like a battle between ego and the universal synchronicities. But if we don't listen to these tiny little signs, sometimes you're going to get something big, like your whole life might fall apart for you to change your environment. Because I find that like the, sh I don't know for you, it's the same, but the shrooms opened up my listening capability, the intuition, you know, yeah. like I, things that I was ignoring maybe in my youth, suddenly mm -hmm. I could see, okay, this is a clue I need to follow. This is a voice I need to listen to. Yeah. It's like something came online that maybe was still there before, but less audible. Yeah, that is that is pure intuition. Yeah. And that comes, I think shrooms are an amazing tool for that. It just opens you up. Yeah. It's fantastic. I do think they're just one of the tools, though. I of don't course. think they are necessary. Um, because when we look at, for example, Hindu Buddhist traditions, they... They do mention Soma in their ancient text. You know, we drank Soma and then we danced with the gods, which implies a psychedelic medicine. Um, however, the whole idea behind their practices, the Kriya Yoga, the purifications, is that we are making our body aware of the subtle energies. And when we are aware of the subtle energies, we are aware of the language of the universe. And this language of the universe again, comes in the same way. You either hear the whispers or you're going to be forced to hear the screams. If you need to change your environment, you might get subtle clues. Oh, here is a podcast on ayahuasca. Here is something that's telling me to Peru. Oh, on my whatever is tracking our advertising on our social media is popping up Peru for me all of a sudden. And if we listen to that, it kind of makes a lot of sense. And if we don't listen to that, something might happen that might completely shatter your comfort zone. Mm. And in this way, I think it's much better for our soul to learn by observing, by listening, by flowing with it, without trying to force or without trying to grasp the comfort. So you're in Australia, you hear the whispers. Mm. I must go to Peru. Yeah. It took me a few months to to really listen to them because I was so comfortable there. I was so in love with everything around me. I had the most perfect situation. Um, and No desire to leave. No desire to leave. I could have stayed that there for a very long time. But eventually the whispers became much louder, almost the screams. And at that point I left everything I moved to India, did my yoga teacher training, and from India came through Europe and flew to Argentina, which was my first stop in in South America. Why Argentina? Well, it was the cheapest flight. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no other reason. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah. It was very easy to get from Barcelona to Argentina. And I was thinking my route will be stopping in Argentina for about a week or two, and then making my way up to Peru. That didn't happen, did it? No, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what happened. I ended up staying in Argentina for probably around three months. I was learning Spanish. I was traveling around. You um, got pulled into the vibe in Argentina. I got pulled into it a lot. Yeah, it's hard to resist that. 
Cool. So it's, it was a good experience. It was a very interesting one. Yeah. It wasn't what I was looking for. And I think because of that, um, again, I was like forced to hear the screams because I was supposed to go to Peru. That was my, that was my mission. Um, but I got stuck into everything that was comfortable again. And Argentina was fun. It's like you're moving through dimensions and you, yeah. you're you almost at the dimension you want, but it's a little bit off or it's a little different. It's yeah. like a limbo in between. Yeah. And I think the way the universe works and the way manifestation works in general is um, when you have something that you want to do, something that your mind is set on, you get these pings and you get the tests. And quite often the universe gives you almost exactly what you want. You have a very clear vision of what you want and it gives you something that's just like a step before that. And it watches if you're going to take it. Like a partial match. Like a partial match, but at the same time, it's a test. Uh -huh. Because if you take that partial match, it means that you're not fully resonating with the full match. You're not holding out for the, the actual vision. You're not, you don't fully trust and believe that that actual vision is fully going to manifest. So you take something that's almost there, but not quite. I and, see that a lot in relationships. <laughs> yeah, and that and that actually, um, it's a test, and it means that you still haven't learned everything that you need to learn to really have this new reality in its fullness. So you need to step back and learn more until you're ready for that really full, complete vision. So for me, I got stuck in Argentina because there were still parts of me that wanted to have this lifestyle where it was all about social interactions. It was all about indulgence. Um, and that's very easy in Argentina. It was all about travel. It was all about things like that. And um, Was it almost like you took your Australia vibe and brought pieces of it to Argentina? <laughs> well, what happened was, I think to some extent, I still needed to purge out a lot of these things before I was ready to go on a really deep, solitary inner journey and that that happened and um in towards the end of those three months i got a very clear sign to leave argentina to actually start that journey that i was going to go on what was that clear sign well i was hitchhiking in the north argentina and um a truck pulled and at this point i was kind of desperate to get a ride so i sat in the truck but by the way, hitchhiking in Argentina, recommend? A lot Follow of intuition. Told <laughs> not, to, not to do it, right? Yeah, everywhere where I was hitchhiking, I got told not to do it. The only countries that were very, very safe and very comfortable were like Taiwan, maybe some parts of Asia, Australia, New Zealand. New Zealand was an easy one. Um, some parts of Europe, but it's always good to follow your intuition. At that point, I did not follow my intuition. I sat in the truck with two big guys on each side. They drove towards our destination, pulled to the side of the road in the middle of the desert, and pulled out knives and machetes on me. What was your <laughs> thought process at that point? Did you know something was wrong the moment you got in the truck? I felt it. It was just, I was denying my intuition in many ways. I just wanted to get where I wanted to go. So they pull off the road. They tell What did they tell you as they pull off the road? They told me they're going to check on the engine. And they pulled off. They went to the front of the truck. They started talking to each other. And they came back. One with a pipe and the other one with a knife. That's crazy. That's it insane. was pretty intense. So it was a very strong message from the universe that something needs to change. And at that point, I thought I'm going to die for sure. Because my intuition as um, coming from years of martial arts was to fight. So when he pulled the pipe on me in the car, I grabbed the pipe, I pushed him down, and then I felt the knife in the back of my ribcage. And the guy basically told me, I'm going to kill you right now. And at that point, I had this realization that I am about to die right now. And that is what it went through my mind. There was, there was a little bit of acceptance. There was mainly panic. And um, it was a very intense moment. It was a very strong trip. And my whole body just flooded with so much adrenaline. Holy shit. <laughs>
yeah that was a that was a strong experience and um i ended up giving them everything i had they dropped me in the middle of the desert they let me go which was pretty kind and generous of them and you, did, um, you didn't know they'd let you go right no i had no idea your, they wanted your money they wanted my money my phone yeah they left me with um just some of my clothes pretty much in the middle of nothing you're in the middle of the desert yeah with just a highway with just a highway and i ended up stopping the car by stepping in front of it because there was almost no cars um passing on that no one would pick you up and no one would pick me up i stood there for five to ten minutes and then i ended up stepping in front of the car to stop it the driver took me to the police station and then the whole another story started um but yeah, eventually, I think this was my this was my push that was showing me that something's wrong. Things are not super aligned. And it was also created a little bit of trauma in my body, just like being in this fight or flight response for like a little period of time um, where I think my angels were looking over me and there was divine intelligence in the whole situation. But it was a strong message to cut the bullshit and start doing what I came there to do. I'm curious, like before that incident happened, did you get any sort of signs that it was time to leave? I, no I probably did. I just, that's what I'm saying. Sometimes we don't, yeah. we are, aren't quiet enough. Our mind is like so active or we, we push ourselves into so many things that are not right for us that we just ignore, and ignore the little signs. So you go to Peru. Yeah. And I started working in ayahuasca centers immediately. Um, from the get-go? From the get-go. I messaged quite a lot of ayahuasca centers um, saying that I want to trade teaching yoga in exchange for staying with them and learning. And that manifested pretty instantly. Actually, the same day as I arrived to Peru, I got a reply of one of the centers. Tell I, me about your first ayahuasca experience. So the first one was a very interesting one because um, I didn't know this medicine at the time, but there is a seed called yopo, which comes from a wilka tree. And the seed is toasted, open, and then ground into powder, and the powder is blown in your nose. The active ingredient of yopo is 5-MeO-DMT, which is probably the most potent type of DMT. It's what people normally use in bufo syrup ceremonies it's it's the same active component just one comes from the frog the toad and the other one comes from the tree um so i was drinking ayahuasca with this couple and i felt like my body was not ready to receive the medicine it was somehow resisting and there were so many layers that i needed to shed before i was like fully open to it so after the first cup i still haven't felt anything so they gave me the second cup of ayahuasca. I still felt like I haven't felt anything. I didn't expect it to be so physical. I was expecting visions, life-changing visions, you know. Um, and at that point, the, the girl from the couple, she comes to me and she asks me, are you feeling something? And I said, no. And she told me, I want you to feel something. Would you like to try Yopo? And I heard of it before literally just before the ceremony and i said yes so she applies yopo to me by blowing it in my nose it's the way hape is traditionally applied which is the medicine of tobacco and um, within an instant my body became so strongly vibrating that i couldn't contain this energy within my body anymore i felt her going for the second nostril um, while I was struggling to stay in my body. But the vibration was so painful that actually I had to decide to leave my body because I could not handle being inside it anymore. So I went to this God source, white light, sacred geometry place where I was one with everything and everything was so perfect and divine. And I was felt like I was there for about a minute and then I came back and then the whole purging of ayahuasca kicked in. Um, that you felt the ayahuasca. That I felt the ayahuasca. What a um, what a potent mix! You what, come back from the five meo place mm -hmm. directly right into, into the, the DMT ayahuasca realm journey. Of the ayahuasca. Yeah, 
Um, and then the purging started and the purging was pretty intense, went on for a little bit. And the way they held the ceremonies was like drinking ayahuasca three times in the night. So we ended up having the second cup, the third cup, and then eventually kind of going to sleep and closing the ceremony. But in the morning, the, the facilitator um, was looking at me and he said, you have a very strong connection with Yopo. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, you were there meditating for a really long time. And I said, I thought that was like one minute. You know, I went to the God source. I met the creator. I came back. It was pretty short. And he was like, no, you probably meditated sitting there for about an hour. So um, he said that he was receiving the message at the same time from Yopo that I should be serving Yopo. But he said, in order for me to do that, I need to learn from it. So he gave me a bottle of ayahuasca and he gave me a bottle of Yopo saying every week, take a little bit of ayahuasca, wait for half an hour and then apply Yopo for yourself. And this is your own personal journey. This is where you need to learn from the medicines, not from the people. People don't matter. Shamans don't matter. Just learn from this medicine. So I ended up doing that for a few months before my later ayahuasca journey. Dude. <laughs> Who, who goes to Peru and the first thing they get is a little bottle of ayahuasca, a little <laughs> bottle of yopo to do their own personal journeys. Yeah, it That's was pretty nuts. It was really interesting because later on, I haven't done any research on yopo, but later on, probably not so long ago, about a year ago, I learned how intense yopo journeys are for most people. Whereas they need to be held sometimes pinned down on the ground be because they can, for the duration of the journey, go crazy. 5-MeO DMT is no joke. It's yeah. not something to mess with. I definitely don't recommend doing it without an experienced facilitator. And same thing with ayahuasca. I think you, for most people, they definitely need an, a shaman to be there. Definitely. I think yours was sort of a rare exception where somehow the shaman knew that you could handle a tiny bit yeah. of that bottle. Yeah. Where right now, for example, whenever I drink ayahuasca, I still seek to do it with very traditional tribes. Yeah. I don't go out and do it by myself, or at least not so often. And um, also, I'm very careful with who I sit with. I think the set and setting are the most important part of the medicine journey. The way the ceremony is held, the space that's held. And by whom. And yeah. by whom. Talk to me a bit about that, because that's super important to, to mention. Yeah, that is something I would definitely talk about, whatever the medicine journey is. It might be mushroom, San Pedro, ayahuasca. It's important to find somebody who has extensive exper experience of working with this medicine. And that is because when we open ourselves to the medicine, when we set an intention, basically our energy field opens up. And our energy field is like, a, or our aura, it's like a shield. Once it's open up, the field is open to anything. So no matter if you believe in entities or not, if you believe in spirits or not, no matter what your beliefs are, you can see that when you ingest something that's an outer substance, something that comes from outside of you, you are allowing yourself to be influenced by things outside of you. So if the space is not held properly, that can go in a lot of different ways. So that can go in a very negative direction as well. I do believe that there's a divine plan behind all of it, even the negative experiences. Um, however, quite often you don't need to have them. Quite often they just happen because of care, uh, carelessness. And when I say space being held properly, when we talk specifically about ayahuasca, I've drank with Western people that are serving it, as well as with people that come from indigenous tribes, such, such as Huniku, Inyawanawa, Kashinawa, Shipibo. Um, the way they serve medicine is in a very different way. They actually make prayers. They talk to spirits. They talk to the spirits of the plant, or they sing Ikaros, which is the song of different plants, the very essence and vibration of the plants that are in a way prescribed to you for healing. So the way homeopathy work, you know, the way the Western medicine works, you go to the doctor, they prescribe the medicine for you. And this medicine heals you. The same way ayahuasca and the shaman 
together are your doctor in this journey. So they prescribe different medicines to you. For example, in Shipibo tradition, they would sing Icaros, which is a frequency of different plants into whatever needs healing in your body. In a way, it's actually the same as homeopathy because homeopathy is a vibration of different plant and so is, so is Icaros, but that comes through the song. And you've since done, since your trip to Peru, which was many years ago, right? You've mm -hmm. done many, many journeys with ayahuasca. Yeah. What are the biggest spiritual or even 3D lessons that you've <laughs> learned from doing this medicine? Because it's so powerful. It just, is just so powerful. Just one trip alone can change someone's life forever. Definitely. It often does. Oh, it often does, yeah. But someone who's done it dozens of times, what kind of lessons have you gleaned from this medicine? I think there's a red line between all of them. And there's um, the thing with ayahuasca specifically is you never know what to expect. They say the mother doesn't give you what you want. It gives you what you need. They call her mother ayahuasca because her nature is very loving. It's very giving. But also sometimes it's like a little bit harsh. It's going to give you exactly what you need. So each journey can look different. Sometimes the journeys for me were very physical. There was no visual aspect to it. I might have felt where there was stuck dense energy in my body and I would help move it and she would help move it. Sometimes it was very visual and it's all it was. I would be moving between different colors and different spirit realms. And um, what I've learned, I think if I draw a red line between ceremonies that go in a very hard direction where... It's basically really hard lessons. It's really hard journey. And the ones that are really beautiful and very poetic and all I want to do is dance and sing all night. The red line is that you are the medicine and that everything is available to you at all times. There is nothing that is not perfect. There is this God essence that is within you all the time. And the medicines, they help remind us that because we get so caught up in the society that is based on consumerism and marketing. And instead, it shows us something that's very primal. And that is that we are not alone here, that we are working with different forces of nature and that we're working with the divine intelligence that is moving through us and through us experiencing itself. So within this way, instead of being caught up in these small problems that we think we have in our day-to-day -day life, it shows us that these problems are just the way the universe experiences itself. And that you don't need anything else. You don't need healing. You don't need anyone to come and save you because where you are and who you are is perfect. And this was kind of the red line that comes through all the ceremonies. Total self-acceptance self-love, connection with the divine. Yes, because how could you not love yourself when you know that you are everything, that you know that you are God? And in the same way, it goes to accepting the shadow aspects of ourselves as well. Sometimes in the way some ceremonies are held, they become quite chaotic. And those are actually my favorite ones. <laughs> Um, the Hunikuin ceremonies, for example, they become very, very loud. They dance a lot. They sing a lot. Um, and when they hold space for mainly for Western people, I haven't seen that happen so many when it's just the indigenous. But in the when they hold space for Western people, quite often there's at least one person that's heavily purging a lot of really deep shit, let's say. And... Um, at first, when I was first seeing this, I was thinking, wow, this person is really, you know, heavy. They're really dense. They're really toxic. And throughout a few ceremonies like this, when I was actually supporting to hold space for that, um, I started to realize that it's not that person. That person is the aspect of me. And my healing journey within that ceremony is me accepting that this is also a part of humanity. This is also a part of society. We cannot just think in our spiritual community, you know, we're all healers, it's all love and light. No, we have to look at the collective. And the collective has some bad stuff going on. 
we still put trash in the oceans. We still, you know, have these corporate companies that are basically consuming. We're still selling pharmaceutical drugs to people that don't need them for, for money. These aren't dumb. This is not bad people and bad companies. This is an aspect of ourselves. And quite often in the spiritual community, I see there's a lot of dissonance from that. It creates a lot of polarity again. And it's um, thinking that, oh, we are love and light. We are healers. We are blessing the earth. We are whatever. Not like and them. Not like them. They are bad. But accepting that shadow aspect of us is not fighting the war. Because when we resist something, we're actually feeding it. So understanding that I am them in a way, there is an aspect of me. And until I heal these, all these aspects of me, nothing else is going to change. We cannot change humanity. We cannot change society. We cannot change anything until we change ourselves. And this is again coming from this, this self-acceptance and this love. Because if I am God, if I am divine, if I am perfect and everything all the time, then I am equally good, quote unquote, as I am bad. So everyone has a shadow aspect. Everyone has a shadow aspect. What is the inner work that we should all be doing to, or the shadow work, as it's often called? Do you do any of that? And I think it's an individual practice. I think it's understanding what is coming up continuously and healing it. I think this is the school of life. I think this is why we incarnated in the bodies, in the world that we did. And we are blessed with at least everyone who is listening to this podcast, you know, we are blessed with so much information. We are blessed with such a community, such strong knowledge. Even the internet itself, we can look at it as something bad, but in a way it's just a connecting web, just like ayahuasca. It's something that is etheric. It doesn't really exist, you know, if we think of existing as a physical reality. Um, but it offers unlimited information and we can learn from that. And throughout that, it becomes an individual journey. And when you realize that you are divine and you let yourself in complete devotion become an instrument of the divine, then you're going to notice that things come up in you that are not of the highest vibration. So, for example, if somebody cuts me off in traffic, I might feel that anger come up for me. And what do I do with that anger? Because this is not my anger. This is the anger of everyone. This is the collective anger. This is the energy of what needs to be transmuted. So what do I do with this? I just look at it and I accept it. And I except that this is what I am. The aspect of me is feeling this emotion because I am everything. So this emotion needs to exist as well. So I think the whole shadow work, the whole, the whole idea of going into the darkness, it's shining the light on it. So when we go into the darkest caves and we shine the light on it, it's not dark anymore. Because there's a light in there. Are most people not even going into the cave? I would say most people are heavily avoiding that cave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it was Joseph Campbell that wrote, the cave you seek to, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Mm. And most people are very afraid to enter these caves. Do you agree with Campbell that there is a treasure in there? For sure. I think everything that is missing in our lives. We, we all want magic. We, we all grew up on fantasy. We all want to live in a world where everything is possible. Um, and yet, when the magic comes, we either numb it or we ignore it. And that comes from conditioning. Give me, give me an example of ignoring magic. Synchronicities. Yeah. Just like hearing the signs, the, the language of the universe, the love notes from Ma. Um, those, are, those are little things that happen. Um, seeing repeating numbers, thinking about a friend and he, they call you, you know, within five minutes and you haven't spoken for them for eight years. That just happens to me. 
I was thinking about someone and they send me a message within less than an hour, someone who I have not spoken for eight years. So these things are, you can call them random, but when everything that happens in your life is leading you directly to when you want to be and everything is so random, can you call it random? <laughs> or is there a divine plan that we're just leaving out? Did you find that after doing all these plant medicines, it opens you up to the magic flow of life and the yeah. seeing the magic and not ignoring it and appreciating every moment of it? Yeah, yeah, I, I find that very strongly. I think there's such powerful tools to open you up to this. If someone wanted to get more magic in their life, what would you recommend to them? I would recommend that you find it in everything you do. So instead of relying on the external substance, instead of, when I first went to Peru, I thought I'm gonna do one ayahuasca ceremony. That's what they all think. <laughs> That's what everyone thinks. You know, I'm gonna do this one ceremony and it's gonna heal me. Forever. Yeah, forever. I don't have to do anything else. It's just one ceremony. <laughs> one pill. One pill. And that's how marketing works, is everyone online is offering us this one thing, you know, even perfume. Mm -hmm. You see an advertisement for perfume and everyone is so happy putting <laughs> these toxic chemicals on their bodies. And they just look so blissfully happy. And you're like, oh, I want that perfume. It's going to make me happy. <laughs> um, I would say if you want magic, just create it. Every time you close your eyes, there is infinite amount of possibilities. And the way the universe works is we're not limited to a physical reality. What we see, what we touch, are just different, different frequencies that are concentrated to, to certain vibration. For example, our visual um, spectrum is very limited if we compare it to, for example, other animals. Our auditory spectrum is also very limited. And we know that, we all know that, we've learned that in school. But we don't know that it's actually the same vibration. So the whole universe is made out of this connecting field of vibration and our physical senses only allow us to see probably a percent of it, if. And when we meet people that are psychic, that are able to see in other worlds, or when we experience with, uh, have experience with psychedelics, those things open up for us. And then we just deny believing that that is there all the time. We just think, oh, this person is psychic, or we don't believe that they're psychic, you know? Maybe we doubt that they exist. Maybe we think they're charlatan. And the same with psychedelics. We think these experiences are limited to psychedelic journeys. They're just imagining, so they're just, just hallucinations. It's just your mind blowing up a little bit of DMT and you're just hallucinating a little bit. The reality is that it just opens up the veil. It just strips you off your limitation of the five senses. Looking Suddenly, the veil, yeah. you have perception of everything that is. And you can either rely on these substances to give you that, or you can think it's something that's outside of you. Or you can start to quiet yourself down so much that you're able to perceive that in your day-to-day -day life. And this is where actually real magic happens, is when you realize that when I look at an object that seems, that seems dense, that seems solid, it's actually just moving particles. And that's something quantum physics has been talking for a little bit. The problem with quantum physics is that it's full of scientists and scientists think in equations. But instead of thinking in equations, let's think in magic. Let's think that we don't need to understand it intellectually. We need to experience it. And what's a good example of that? It's emotion, it's manifestation, it's the thought in your head. The thoughts, you cannot grab them. Same with emotions. They're not something you can quantify, but it is very present in your body. And just like when you see um, when you look into dimensions, the second dimension, if you look at the square, that's a second dimension. If you look at the cube, that's a third dimension. But let's say you have this cube and you shine the light on the cube. You see the shadow of the, the cube is the square. Mm -hmm. So the third dimensional objects always have a shadow of the two dimension. So the same way fourth dimensional experiences have shadow that is the third dimension. 
So whatever we feel and perceive in this seemingly solid reality, it's actually just a shadow of the dimension above that. So our emotions, they're not graspable. Our thoughts, we cannot grasp them. We cannot put them in the third dimension. We cannot limit them to time or space. But they are, in a way, what is creating our entire reality. And I think this is how this power of healing your physical body or manifesting your physical reality can actually happen. It's because when you are in control of something that's a fourth dimensional experience, you are shedding the the shadow of, in the third dimension. I love that you bring up the shadow of the fourth dimension. It reminds me of Neville Goddard's work mm. where he talks about how this 3D world is just a shadow. Yeah. And he actually talks about the fourth dimension being the real world, like the world of your imagination, the mental world mm -hmm. is the real world. And this is just the delayed, time delayed shadow. Exactly. Do you have any manifestation techniques or do you work with intention or affirmations? Or um, I'm curious about your practices around manifestation. So the retreats that I lead, we actually incorporate a lot of these things in there. We um, do a lot of practices such as emotional freedom technique. We do trauma release exercises, which are more like physical ways of dealing with emotion. But then we also add a lot of visualization. We also teach people how to um, do their own sh shamanic journeys through, through visualization, through their own internal processes. However, in my personal life, I found that when I'm trying to manifest, there is always this, this dilemma aspect to it, where I know that there is a divine plan and I believe, I believe in the God essence, maybe not a God with a beard or a God without a beard or 10 different gods, <laughs> but there is this, the source. this source, this connective field, which we all come from. I think Joseph Campbell called it the, the great solar light. The great solar light, I like that. Jung was talking about it, the collective unconscious as well. Yeah. I think it's maybe collective unconscious is a little bit of a limiting term. I think the source is a pretty good term, but that's also limiting because it's not just the source. It's also everything that is right now, mm -hmm. not just where things came from. Um, but I would say that there's a, our, our soul come as aspects of this infinite energy and we are just fractions for it to experience itself so in order for something that is infinitely perfect that is completely divine in its perfection for it to know what it is and experience itself it needs to create contrast it needs to create duality and they describe that in taoism first there was tao and then from tao came the duality it came yin and yang from yin and yang became the elements um, pretty much all the holy books talk about the same, the same principles. The way um, in Hinduism as well the world was created, the way in Bible the world was created, it all came from this one source, one God. And um, for it to know itself, it needs to create polarity, it needs to create duality. The hermetic principle of polarity talks that we do not know one if we don't know the opposite. So in this way, we all incarnated as souls bringing each other lessons and our lessons are to trigger each other sometimes in good ways sometimes in bad ways sometimes through throwing trash and sometimes through spreading love and um and this is one of the most important things that we are here to learn our soul lessons more than seeking comfort more than wanting my life to be full of beautiful travel and destinations and whatever, big cars and a lot of money. More than that, my goal is to evolve my soul as much as I can before I die. Because all the material stuff is gonna go away. Even this body that I've worked so much on creating to as much perfection as I possibly could, it's gonna die. But the soul keeps evolving. So this is the dilemma I've had within my manifestations because my ego, my physical body, it wants comfort. It wants to feel safe. And I know that on a soul level, I need to push it out of the comfort zone to have it growing. And this is where I think 
my biggest soul lessons actually came from the experiences that were so extreme. When I was homeless, when I almost died in Vietnam on the road, when I was robbed in Argentina, those moments were where my soul just got a massive upgrade, such as most ayahuasca ceremonies I've had, actually. Probably I've done dozens and I would say maybe half of them were very pleasant and the other half went to the most pleasant extre unpleasant extreme. And same with Yopo, with Wachuma, with mushrooms. I always have the whole duality. And this is where if you just manifest because you want to be comfortable, you might get it because that's just how the universe works. You probably will get it. But again, it comes to the same thing. Does money make you happy? And that's a question that's just like a very general question that's been kind of discussed a little bit, you know, but no one goes to the source of it. Why doesn't it actually make you happy? Is it because you're relying on something external? Or is it because your soul is actually not growing from this? Mm -hmm. Because you're actually giving yourself just so much comfort for your ego, for whatever reason, to feel the power or to feel whatever. Even just people that are consciously manifesting all the time in a way they're just looking for more power, they're looking for more comfort. But your soul doesn't want that all the time. Maybe it's a very individual journey. Um, same as with shadow work, it's a very individual journey. It's hard to say that is one thing for everyone. So maybe what we should all be manifesting is more soul lessons. More soul lessons, yeah. It's like bring me the hardest, most difficult experience. That was my intention for the, my first ayahuasca ceremony, actually. And now looking back at, it, back at it, I think it was a hard thing to say. <laughs> you actually intended for it to be difficult. Yes, my first ayahuasca ceremony... My intention going into the ceremony was show me the deepest, darkest places of my mind. Wow. Um, and I know how deep and dark ayahuasca can get right now. At the time, I didn't. Um, so Would I'm, you have made the same intention if you'd Probably known? not. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember when I was... Um, when I was growing up, I would read about these intense experiences people have with, for example, Kundalini awakening. It's not a pleasant thing for most of the people, uh, especially the spontaneous Kundalini awakening. Sometimes people cannot be in the society around people. Sometimes they cannot communicate. It's like so intense. And, and I would be reading these experiences and I would be like, wow, I want that. Bring and it the, on. Bring it on. And the same when I first heard about ayahuasca, they were saying like, wow, it's really intense, but it's like, you know, it shows you the reality as it, as it is. And it can be really dark and it can be really heavy and hard. And I would read this sentence and I would be like, I want that. Mm. Yeah. Give me the dark. Give me the heavy. Give me the hard because I want to, I want to tr transcend. I want to keep growing. And it did. And it did many times. And I feel like that's the difference between people that are, you know, that are evolving, that are shamans, that are, that are healers and people that just want comfort in their manifestations is because one is going to ask for an easy life and wow. the other one is going to ask for the hardest possible lessons so they can grow, their soul can grow, not just their ego to be pleased. I think a good intention for ayahuasca and mushrooms is show me who I truly am mm. or show me the next step in my evolution. So it's like you're kind of leaving it up to the universe, the the difficulty level, because it knows best what you can handle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, especially with ayahuasca, every single ceremony I've done, I've gotten a whole different set of lessons. Yeah. Uh, completely unique trips. With mushrooms, it's a little bit more, at least for me, it's a little bit more consistent. Mm -hmm. Where if I don't do a certain lesson or certain homework, it'll come back in the next trip. I'll be like, why haven't you done this? Why haven't you been working on this? Yeah, and that goes beyond the trip. In yeah. life, in general, if you don't do your homework, mm -hmm. it just comes back. Yeah. And um, coming back to this, to this intention, show me who I really am. There's such vastness to it. I remember one ceremony with this Taita. Um, taita means um, healer, curandero in the tradition in Putumayo, which is the jungle area of Colombia. I had an intention um, to see the reality as it is in its completeness. 
And I said, I want my third eye to open and see everything. And within minutes of drinking the medicine, my third eye opened and I saw everything to the point where my body was so uncomfortable with the amounts of energy that were going through my body. I could visually, I was getting so overwhelmed because I would open my eyes, I would close them. There would be infinite amounts of images of entities of spirit circling around me. There would be just the vibration permeating everything. It was such an overwhelming experience that it was possibly slightly traumatizing at that point. Our brains can't even handle the totality yeah. of the frequencies that are around us. There is a story, I don't remember where it comes from, and the story goes, um, someone was meeting angels and or extraterrestrials, or I don't remember the, the exact thing, um, and they brought the chest in front of him, and they were like, in this chest is the whole potential of all the humanity. And he wanted to see it. And they were like, no, you're not ready for this. And he begged them and begged them, can I please see it? I want to see it. I really want to see it. And they were like, we're going to open the chest for the size of one hair. And that's all you can get. And he was like, okay. So they opened the chest for the size of one hair. And the amount of energy, the amount of light that came out of that box was so intense that it was terrifying. So I think this story describes our fullest potential. It's so beyond our imagination. It's so beyond everything we can perceive that it's terrifying. And when you have this intention for the ceremony, for me, was one of the most terrifying things. And it wasn't anything bad about it. It was just the amount of energy that was flowing through my body and around me was so intense. The intensity takes your breath away. The intensity can be so powerful, can be so overwhelming. I thought shrooms was could get intense on a heavy dose, mm -hmm. but ayahuasca takes it to the next level. It does. Yeah, um, it's a powerful psychedelic. What do you think is the the true nature of the universe? Like having experienced so many different realms, what are your theories on where are we? Are we in a dream? Are we in a hologram? <laughs> Do you have an understanding of that? I would say I have an insight from my perspective. Again, being in a limited human form. I think there is, a, as I've said before, there's like this totality, there's this source that just wants to experience itself. And that is the energy that in its essence, it's everything. So it's perfect. And it's encompassing everything. So the way it experiences itself, it's, it, um, it fractures or fragments into infinite amounts of possibilities. Some of these possibilities is this little spectrum of humans. Some of it is the spectrum of spirit world. Some of it is the animal, plant world. There are so many different dimensions, so many different universes, so many things that we cannot even comprehend or we never will. But as humans, we just incarnated um, in human form as fractions of the divine. That's why when people die, and we can know that from near-death experiences, from hypnosis sessions, um, and there's this wonderful author called Dolores Cannon. She writes books about her work and her work is um, hypnotherapy. So at first she started hypnotizing people and realizing that when they describe their past lives, they're not just describing their past lives on earth. And the scenarios that they described were extraterrestrial scenarios. And then some people put their... Um, their stories matched, even though they did not know each other, even though they come from different backgrounds, different parts of the world, they did not know each other. Different people, different, different transcriptions, people. different time. Different times, and the their stories match. matched. So Dolores Cannon started putting everything into books. I think she has 19 books written, which are just transcripts of all her hypnotherapy sessions. And throughout that, she accessed people super conscious. And super conscious is the aspect that maybe it's been touched in psychotherapy, 
they call it subconscious, but that's a very limited term um, because it's not actually a below consciousness. It's quite above it. That's why she calls it super conscious. Is, it, is that like your divine self? This is like your divine self. This is your essence. Mm -hmm. So when you go into other lives and other planets, you can see where you came from maybe, or where your soul feels most at home or different interactions between different worlds and dimensions, or maybe like pre-written civilizations. But when you're talking to super conscious, that's the essence of what is. It just knows everything because that's the that's that fragment of the source that's not limited to a physical form. So she talks with people and she asks them questions. She asks them questions about their past lives, maybe on Earth, maybe on other planets. And the first time I've heard one of her books, and I've intellectually kind of understood this idea that maybe we're incarnating. You know, I've been heavily influenced with the Buddhist and Hindu tradition. So I know that maybe this life is not all there is. But it was un wasn't until I heard Dolores Cannon's work that my perception completely changed. Because we can listen to science as much as we want. And science is really trying to prove everything. I'm not denying it. But it's very limited. Whereas when you talk directly to people's super conscious minds, when they describe same scenarios, not knowing each other, totally different backgrounds, how is that possible? So they must be tapping into a unified field of consciousness. They might be tapping into something that is beyond our perception. So we know that that exists. It's like hundred monkeys effect, you know? Mm -hmm. When I first re read some of her books, it was just mind blowing how undeniable it is right now because if my conscious mind my monkey man, mind wants to start negating it it actually becomes really difficult because in a way she's scientifically proving it and i would definitely recommend that everyone at least looks into her work a little bit because is there a book you recommend from her to start with the convoluted universe is a good one i think it has three volumes um also, you can get it on Audible. You can listen to audiobooks. It's a much easier way to digest it. What was the, the craziest thing you learned from Dolores Cannon? Like where you're like, holy shit, like, that can't be true. Well, once you hear some of it, I think it all falls in the same category. Uh -huh. I think it's just getting over the initial shock that everything we've been taught in school is just not correct. And once you get over that, you start asking yourself different types of questions. For example, what is in the center of the earth? Tell me. <laughs> What's your theory on it? I don't know. I don't have a theory. But it's something that I've been asked these questions and my response immediately was lava. You uh -huh. know? Because that's what you've been taught. Because that's what I've been taught in school. And the guy who asked me the question asked, like, why do you think it's lava? And I was like, that's what I've been taught in school. As soon as I heard my response... You start I yourself. realized that's not what's there because nobody went there. Nobody knows. The same as we talk about extraterrestrials and life on other planets. Who's been there? Who knows? But isn't it true that they've done scientific work to figure out? Quite possibly. I think science is very limited. I think when we look at the, the human body in itself, when we talk about medicine, for example, I think science is so far behind traditions that have been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. Mm. Science is something that has been around for a few hundred years. And you've worked, you've worked with many indigenous tribes mm -hmm. in Peru, in Ecuador, in Colombia, yeah. um, and also the Brazilian tribe that you have been working for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. What kind of wisdom or knowledge do they have that Western civilization doesn't have access to? There's a, I'm just going to go slightly off topic to this question and I'll just come back to it. There's this really fascinating thing when we look at the indigenous communities. Um, in Mexico, uh, Kukulkan is one of the gods, the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl, it's another one. When we look at um, Hindu tradition, and right now, where we're doing the podcast in Bali, we can see a, lot, see a lot of Hindu depictions of different deities. And quite a lot of them look exactly the same. 
the seven serpents over the top of the head is one depiction that can be seen in Aztec, in Mexico, in the pyramids. Also the pyramids, they've, they exist in Mexico, they exist in Egypt, they exist in Asia. Um, so there's a lot of very strong commonalities among different traditions that are really ancient. And then if we look at the systems that are overlooking, for example, the body, Ayurveda, um, the, the in, from the Indian Vedas, from the scripts, which is the basis of you know, yoga as well, um, they talk about body in a very specific way. And science is just barely starting to catch up with this. The same with Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine talks about meridians in the body, these energy channels. And when we look at Ayurveda, which comes from India, they talk about nadis, the 72,000 energy channels. So there's these commonalities that are very similar no matter which tradition we look at. For example, breath as well, working with breath work, pranayama in Hindu tradition, in Indian yoga, as well as um, Taoist breath from China, as well as um, Andean breath work that's coming from the Andes in Peru and the Amazonian types of breath work. They've all had these traditions for thousands and thousands of years. And science is just starting to prove the benefits of breathwork now, which so it's a bit late. So things doing for thousands <laughs> of years, now yeah. we have the scientific basis to Be say. Because it's the wrong way to look at it. Well, not that there is right or wrong, but it's a very limited way to look at it. Because we're looking at, oh, I need to prove that this is actually beneficial to me. How about instead of spending thousands and thousands or billions of dollars on trying to prove through studies, how about you just actually do it? How about instead of trying to prove what meditation does to your brain, you just go and meditate? And instead of trying to prove the benefits of breath work on the physical body, how about you just go and do it? That's why the science is never going to catch up to the ancient wisdom, because it's it's trying to write more books. We don't need more books. We need more experience. And this is what this ancient wisdom is from these traditional tribes. For example, Huniku in Kashinawa, Yawanawa from Brazil, they, they sing prayers to spirits. And that's the way they hold ceremonies with, with the mother Ayahuasca, is throughout the whole ceremonies, they will be singing the prayers. And that's how they hold space. It's just a prayer ceremony. Same within certain ceremonies in Mexico, um, Temascali, the traditional sweat lodge, it's a prayer ceremony. It's a ceremony where you're praying to the water by limiting the water intake. You're actually inside, the sweat lodge is made in a shape of the womb. Mm -hmm. So it's representing the womb of the mother earth. And you are praying within that womb, knowing that she's taking care of you completely. And this is a prayer ceremony as well. In Hindu tradition, they don't use psychedelics, at least in modern Hindu tradition. Um, but they pray every day. We can see that where we are now. Every morning they bring out offerings to the temples. Every So for sunrise, for sunset, and some people for midnight as well, the most auspicious times. And they know that the spirits exist. They know the spirits come to take the offerings. They know the deities are dancing between them. And this is the most powerful wisdom that we as society have started numbing because this masculine patriarchal approach to trying to control the world just cannot comprehend the magic of the invisible. And the society has been built on science. The society has been built on like these limited structures. What we learn in school is such outdated information. I've been talking to a couple of doctors that are my best friends and some of the facilitators as well at my retreats. They said that when they went to school, to the medical school, some of them are MDs, they said that the information given to them was already outdated back then. And that was 15, 20 years ago. And they're still teaching the same information. The latest science of biohacking, of nutrition or wellness did not catch up. They still teach you the food pyramid where the carbohydrates are on the bottom, which we all know not to be the best thing. Um, For people who want to find the most up-to-date knowledge, where, do they, where should they go? For the most up-to-date knowledge, I would say there's a lot of research that needs to take place. And I wouldn't say I claim 
to know what it is. Mm -hmm. Within the circles where some of my community is, I think it's fairly recent and updated and it's very, um, let's say, proved. Do you feel disconnected when you go to, you know, big cities back to sort of Western society? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. That was one of my first really big shocks was after leaving the jungle for the first time. Um, I don't remember exactly where that was. It might have been in Peru, I think. I left the jungle and I went to a bigger city and I was in such a shock. How do people not live with compost toilets? How do people not harvest their own food? And supermarkets are such a waste. There's food that could feed hundreds of people in there. And most of it is going to get thrown in the trash. It's just mass produced, these kind of things. And then all the marketing and all the spending money on things that we don't need, you know, new clothes or perfumes, they're toxic to the body. And then watching as well what people consume, for me, still becomes a shock. How are you still drinking alcohol? Have you not get the latest memo <laughs> how why are you eating sugar you know it works like cocaine on your brain i think um, addiction is part of it as well addiction though. is part of it numbing is part of it the lack of information or the ignorance is part of it but that is something that we just cannot keep denying because right now we have internet everything is on the internet you need a few searches and you're going to know what is good and not for you you know it doesn't take a genius to give you a nutrition plan you need to have your own wisdom, your own guidance within your own body as well to discover what works for you. Because that's also something that happens with the trends. We look at different diets and some person healed from a certain illness by following a certain diet. So they're going to be selling this course on how you can do the same. But my question is, can you? Can you actually follow the diet that worked for someone else? and have the same result by yourself? Maybe, maybe not. What is your, your dream for the planet? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't think I have any dreams that I would want to specifically manifest. I think I'm allowing whatever needs to happen to come through. Do you have a dream of seeing these cities that are a bit disconnected from the na natural world to come together with nature, to for people to come together, for communities to come together? I want to say I would like to see that, but that would imply that I have personal desire to do that. I think it's a, all a part of a larger plan again. It's the divine intelligence that's guiding whatever way it goes to. So it's the trust, the trust that things are working out as they should be. I think everything is going to go in the direction where it needs to go. When the more we awaken to that understanding, the more we're going to follow our own personal discernment, our connection to the source, because that is the most important. And when we connect to the Mother Earth and when we connect to the source, we're going to be acting in the way that's in most integrity with the way that it's in the benefit of all. Um, so when a mass awakens to that, I think it can create a huge change. But if the mass doesn't awaken to that, I think that's also a part of the divine plan. Our job for people who have started waking up to that already is that we sh spread it and we share it as much as we can. That's why some of our biggest projects, some of our visions within my community are just to spread it as much as we can. But aside from that, we cannot force people to change. We cannot force society to change. Um, what we can do is not to fight it, to accept it as a shadow aspect of ourselves and then keep going in the direction that is moving us towards ascension instead of making us fight. And I'm saying that because, as you know, my previous blog, The Unconditioned Curiosity, a lot of my posts were fairly environmental. I would have these huge monologues where I would go about how society is messed up because of what they are doing to environment, to Mother Earth. And it was 
such strong passion within me to change that. But in a way, I'm still feeding the same animal. I'm still feeding the same energy. So instead of trying to fight that, instead of trying to change that, I will do whatever my soul needs to do to awaken as many other souls as it can. And I'm not fighting it anymore. I trust that the divine has everything in its own hands. And whoever needs to be in this journey in whatever way they need to are going to learn exactly the soul lessons that they need to learn. And if that means that as humanity we're going towards extinction and we're going to build more cities and pollute more earth, I think that's what needs to happen. And if the opposite happens, I would be very happy to see that. And of course, we're going to step up and do as much as we possibly can to make that happen. But at the end of the day, relax, because everything is out of your control. <laughs> and also, the I, I think the personal healing journey for every single individual, that's where our power is. Yeah. That's kind of what I've seen through my own journeys with plant medicine is the more I work on myself, that's where the most impact I can have. Because if I can heal my own traumas, heal my own wounds, then the whole planet benefits from that if everyone yeah. is working on their own journey. Yeah, well, it's this collective consciousness again. It's the the hundred month monkey effect is um, a theory that when there are hundred monkeys on one island or whatever amount of monkeys on one island. And the first one will start to, to learn how to use a new tool. And then by watching the first one, the second one is going to learn how to use the new tool. And 99 monkeys are going to learn how to use the new tool. And then when the 100th monkey learns how to use a new tool, monkeys on the other island that are separate and have no interaction between each other are going to learn how to use the same tool as well. So by the time we reach the hundredth monkey, there's a cascading effect that affects that the That affects other the consciousness in total, yeah. So when we talk about quantum physics, for example, the superposition means that two particles can exist and not at the same time. So that's the Schrodinger's cat. Um, but what when it goes further is when it says that when two particles are um, interacting with each other, there one in one there's going to be one um, outcome on the other side there's going to be the opposite out outcome so when we talk about schrodinger's cat the cat being either dead or alive mm -hmm. and dead and alive at the same time um, we eliminate when we have two boxes we eliminate the possibility that both outcomes are the same so no matter how far away the particles are from each other they're always going to produce the opposite outcome that's quantum physics, which is something that has been pro proven. And I don't want to go into the whole thing right now because it's a vast topic. But just to say um, where that relates to is the fact that particles talk to each other, mm -hmm. no matter where in the universe they are. So what we do in our bodies, how in integrity are, we are, how connected we are, is directly influencing something else because of this collective field. And that's where I'm not sure if the hundredth monkey effect is a theory or if it's a study, but that's where it comes from. It basically means that once we infuse the collective consciousness with a piece of information, that piece of information is available. And in the spiritual community, that's talked about a lot as Akashic Records, for example, um, which is the library of everything that's available to humanity. And this is in the same state, in the same etheric realm. It's where everything is available all the time, this tapping into collective source. It feels like we're reaching a cascading point in reality where so many people are exploring spirituality and plant medicine. It's mm. like a tipping point that we've yeah. reached where it's like the hundredth monkey effect where now everyone knows about ayahuasca or, mm -hmm. or more and more people and more and more people feel called to it. Yeah. Is there any advice you have for people who have never done Aya, but feel the call, what would you tell them to focus on? Focus on finding the right space to do it at. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that integration is as taken care of as the journey itself. Uh, one of my teachers used to say that integration circles are the medicine. 
He said integration circles are more powerful than drinking ayahuasca. Integration circles is the, the morning after. The morning after or the afternoon after. Where everyone have a little gathers nap. together yeah. and shares. And they share their experience. He said that ayahuasca, the way it works is it moves like a snake throughout the ceremony. So some person might get a head and the other person might get the tail. But you don't know how your journey is affecting the collective. You don't know how your personal feeling, uh, healing is uh, um, affecting collective healing until you know how the whole ceremony went. So you need to hear other people's perspective as well. And sometimes what seemed like a difficult journey for you, you might have a contrast. Maybe somebody had much more difficult journey than you. And maybe that for you already is like very healing or just understanding how other people had the most beautiful journey as well might help you with the integration. And just talking to a person who is leading the ceremony, making sure that they're very experienced at what they do, and they're drawing on at least some sort of the wisdom that's coming from the people that the medicine is coming from, I would say it's very important. So yeah, integration definitely before and after the ceremony is super important. One thing I noticed in my circles after the ceremonies is that even the people who were having the toughest time in the trip, and you could tell, you know, mm. they were crying all night, they were purging all night. In the morning, every single person in the group was like grateful. Yeah. Like, gracias a la madre, gracias a la madre. You know, yeah. they're, they're feeling the gratitude to the mother. Yeah. And even the person that I know was having just the most difficult time, they are still finding in that experience something really powerful for them. And I found that really inspiring to, to see that in every person. Not one person said that was the the worst thing that ever happened. <laughs> I'm, you know, I've had some when I, where I said that. I've had some ceremonies that were fairly traumatizing. And that's where I think it's very important for people to understand yeah. the way the medicine works. And if you sign up for a retreat that's going to give you three ceremonies, the medicine, the this intelligent of the plant is going to work throughout the three ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get a beginning and you're going to get the end. It's important to follow up with the process. For me, all the healing that I needed from that ceremony that was not making me feel the best was just to do another one right after. Because from the next one, I learned that what was actually a tough process for me was just me not accepting my not surrendering to the medicine or not accepting my ego. And that's why it's also like when you are coming from, let's say, the, the 3D matrix, when you are coming from, you know, living in a box life, in a box apartment, in nine to five job. Um, when you come into these ceremonies, it's important that you are interacting with people that have been going through the process. That's why I mentioned integration. It's so important. If you have access to um, psychedelic integration specialists, that might be even better. We might think that's not necessary and I can handle it and you probably can, but it's like shine, going into the forest and going there with a flashlight. You know, the flashlight is illuminating a direct path that you can see. Whereas if you go with just a light bulb, it's gonna shine a little bit towards everywhere, but you're not really gonna see the way. So some people, that help you discover your intention, that help you integrate after. If you have this process, it's much more powerful than even doing tens or 20 ceremonies that are not being integrated properly. So finding mentors, finding people who can help you integrate. Yeah. That's the key to not just doing the medicine for the sake of doing it, but to heal and learn from it. Exactly. Because we can also see that in our communities, you can always meet people that are just going back for it more and more mm. because they, they are not able to get their homework, you know? They're seeking something other than maybe what they came for initially. Yeah. And in my personal journey, I can say I haven't touched any psychedelics for seven months now, which for me coming from, you know, doing it every day in the jungle of Peru, is um is quite a long time but right now i'm at the stage where i'm feeling like i don't need that because everything that i need answers to is coming from my meditation practice and i know when i close my eyes again i'm in this shamanic imagery world where it's infinite possibilities of everything 
And I know that what I'm experiencing here is just the shadow, the 3D shadow of the 4D world. And it doesn't need a psychedelic for me to show me that. It doesn't need this external intelligence to show me that. So that's another lesson that is like really powerful coming from that. And I would encourage everyone who does feel the call. Maybe that's not for you. Maybe ayahuasca is not for you and maybe mushrooms are. Maybe none of it is for you. I'm encouraging for people to find whatever works for you. Because you can also access DMT states without the psychedelics. Through breath work. Through breath work, for example. So tuning in to your gut and just feeling it out, seeing, is this for me? Is this not, why am I called to it? What is my intention? Yeah, why am I even like considering doing it? Is it because everyone else has done it so far? Or is it's it, a popular thing to it's do. It's a popular thing to do. It's trendy right now. Do I want to do it because it's trendy? Or is it something your soul wants you to do? And if that's the case, then please go ahead and do it. But if it's just something that you're doing because you're following the trend, then really look deeper at what you're trying to get out of it. Because the medicine might not give you that. If there's still an issue that needs to be solved, it might illuminate it for you, but you're going to have to work after Jacob, it's been such a pleasure having you on the podcast and it's been just a fantastic conversation. Is there something you'd like to leave the listeners with? Some piece of advice on how they can either tune into themselves or or to live an epic life? <laughs> I would say there's so many things you can do. I'm literally just overwhelmed by your question by thinking of everything I could say right now. <laughs> well, let me specify it. Yeah, like what is the what is one thing that someone could could do to to live a more epic life? I would say learn to be embodied. Le- learn to embody these energies. Because we can travel all these astral realms. And at the end of the day, we did incarnate in a human form. So just being really embodied in everything you do, I think it's our biggest purpose. And it doesn't go far beyond that when we're talking about the purpose of life. It doesn't have to be to make millions of dollars or influence millions of people. It's just experience, this human experience. So when you say embodied, you mean just being? Just being with everything that comes. Be with your less than positive emotions. Be with whatever is coming up for you. Feel it, feel it in your body. Feel your connection to the source, but without going there while still being here. I would say the most powerful thing in my journey is being in complete devotion. And sometimes religions try to force that and then it becomes all corrupt and weird. Um, But behind that, there is such profound wisdom. Because when you are in devotion, when you are understanding that there is higher power and source, you are free. You are literally free to experience the free will, you are exper- to experience the embodiment of the human self. And um, learn to take care of that human vessel as well. There's like where a lot of nutrition you can learn, when you can start moving, when you can start adjo- enjoying whatever your physical experience is. Um, and then your mind, develop your mind. That is also a powerful tool that we have, meditate. Um, so all of these, I would say, come into like the embodiment aspect of, of being human. Wonderful. Where can people find you? I have a website called Vortex Retreats, which is a company that organizes different retreats in different powerful vortex locations around the world. And we work a lot with plant medicine, guiding people through integration from a week before to weeks after the retreat itself. But within the retreats, we are going as deep as we possibly can. And I have some of the best facilitators working with crystal alchemy bowls, leading breath work. I have some shamanic musicians that are guiding the medicine journeys. We have pre-written microdosing protocols that are going to help you break through everything that's holding you back, as well as EFT, emotional freedom technique, trauma releases, stuff like that. And... If you want to see what we're offering, we have it on the page vortexretreats.com. And we're going to be moving around. So there's always a chance to go to the location that feels the best for you, but it's going to stay a strong group of facilitators that I know can really hold the space. 
And then the exciting thing that happened is we just became a part of the collective called Satori, which is allowing people to go through guided integrations, pre and post retreat, if they sign up through their platform. So that's giving you basically a shopping list of all the therapists. So you can choose who you want to work with individually, one of one to have like your specific integration. So for integration, it's really the place to go is vortexretreats.com it's, and the the facilitation that you mentioned with Yeah, with therapists. Satori, it's, it's really powerful. The way we're doing it as well in our retreats is we have a psychedelic integration coach on site at all times. As well as we're working with different frequency technologies, so we're weaving in the science, the modern science, um, as well into the mix. Um, and some of it is actually quite ancient knowledge, and some of it is quite modern, as well as modern energy healing techniques, such as pranic healing and theta healing, reiki, they're all kind of a mix of everything that we do and we offer. Awesome. Jacob, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to The James Zander Trip. Thank you for tuning in and a big thank you to Jacob for coming on as my first guest on the podcast. It's been an absolute honor to have you on. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the world to me if you shared it with one friend who would resonate with this message. I think uh, there's a lot of people out there who are seeking conversations just like this and it would mean a lot to me if you shared it with someone that you know. If you want to connect with me personally, I invite you to visit jameszander.com and send me a message. Tell me a bit about who you are, your story, your experiences with plant medicine or spirituality. I'd love to hear from you. Much love, and I'll see you in the next episode.